Good afternoon, seniors. Um, my apologies for not being here today, but I trust that you will get a lot out of this lecture. Um, and please work with your classmates. Uh, Trayvon and Jocelyn, should, one of the two, should be up at the computer right now. Um, please work with them so that everybody can get the basic information. But also note that if most of the room is ready to move on, please do so. Um, there's only so much time in the day, right? Um, and I will give you guys this link to um, the YouTube video so that you can look it up on your own, on your own time, if you miss notes. So again, if you miss notes and everybody else is ready to go, just leave it blank and you can look it up on your own time. So today is Introduction to Campaigns. We're going to spend about two to three lectures talking about campaigns, the exact process of how do we choose our leaders, right? Democracy, elections, choosing our leaders. The big idea for today. Political campaigns are the most visible aspect of political participation, but are very imperfect means to pick our leaders. They're a very imperfect means to pick our leaders. There's lots of problems with it, but we need to get to the basics before we can go. So, steps of presidential campaigns. You'll see the same slide again next lecture, but I want to make sure we have the big picture of all the parts we're going to explain and analyze over the course of these next three lectures. Step one, the presidential campaign. First, you need to declare that you are running. Second, you need to then campaign for your party nomination. Recall, before President Obama was able to run for president, he first needed to run for to be Democratic nominee for president. Next, you be be nominated, sorry, be nominated by your party. We saw the video of Obama being nominated in 2008. Remember all the people cheering? And then final next step, um, you need to campaign to win the general election. So that's the election where the end result is actually choosing the, the person who will win that office. And then, of course, win. Quick side note, um, we're focusing only on presidential elections uh, sorry, presidential campaigns in this class because, again, it's AP United States Government Politics and United States President is the only campaign that is a national campaign that we can study. Otherwise, we'd be looking at state campaigns. So we're only talking about presidential campaigns during this part of class. So the nomination process. So as I said, the first step is to declare that you're running. It's just that. It is a statement. Um, it is a legal document that says, I officially am running for President of the United States. As someone mentioned before in other classes, you need to have a certain number of signatures on a petition before, and then turn in that petition and say, all right, I'm officially running for President of the United States. The problem with it, this, though, many people decide not to run. We're going to walk through real quick the example of General Colin Powell. Um, on my version right now on my iPad, there's no picture showing up. So if this picture is not showing up, if whoever's at the computer, if you could pause real quick and just do a quick Google image search so everyone can see who General Colin Powell is, when you see his picture, you will likely recognize who he is. So go ahead and look that up. Alrighty. So why did he decide not to run? Or who is he in the first place and why is this important? So General Colin Powell... Um, one, he was a beloved general in the 1980s and 1990s. He was the first black man to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was the first black man to rise to what is essentially the highest military rank in the country. He helped win the Gulf War. He was very successful and universally liked by just about every single American. You say Colin Powell, they think good things. He was respected. All right? He eventually became Secretary of State under... Um, President Bush, okay, so he was a smart man, a well-respected man, military leader, why not run for president, right? Two main reasons. Two main reasons Colin Powell did not run. First, the energy required to run for president, the energy, there's supposed to be there, energy, and time needed to run for president. He was a military guy, Though he probably could have won, all right, university-like guy, he didn't want to have to spend all the time and energy campaigning. He could have been president, didn't want to be president because of campaigning was such a burden. It took so much energy and time. Two, his family. His family didn't want him to run. And when you are president, you are president 
24-7 for as long as you hold that office, right? His wife did not want to see him have to go through that constant, constant stress. And this is also the 1990s when he would have been considering to be running, and she was worried that if a black man tried to run for president, that there was a very good chance that he would get shot. So he did not want to spend the energy and time doing it, and the concern for his family, he did not end up running for president. He would have been a great president, and he could have easily gotten elected. But he didn't choose to run, and we never had President Colin Powell. So, the actual nomination process. You've declared, you've taken this big risk. Your family is willing to take this huge risk, spend the next essentially eight months to, sorry, probably 12 to eight months of your life non-stop campaigning, and should you win, you then spend the next years non-stop leading the country. A very stressful job, right? So, the first step in winning that nomination. Each state has what are called primaries or caucuses. The state will either have a primary or a caucus. So the Republican Party would have a primary in the state of Illinois to decide who the people of Illinois want to be the Republican nominee. The Democrats would organize their own primary election as well. So primaries. There's two types. This is simply a review from previous, um, from last unit. There are two types of primaries. We have an open and closed primary. We even talked about um, the differences, right? Closed primaries encourage party loyalty. Open primaries, anybody can walk up that day and say, I want to participate in the Republican Party primary or the Democratic Party primary. Right? Primary is an actual election. Whoever gets the most votes ends up um, then being the nominee for that state. And then if you win the most states, you then become that party's nominee. A caucus is something very similar to a primary. It's an old-fashioned way before primaries became popular. It was an old-fashioned way of choosing uh, a nominee for office. Today it only happens in rural states, rural and small states. Okay, so there's the Iowa caucus every year, um, and there are the um, South Carolina caucuses for some, a few parties, and then some of the northeastern states have it. Mainly, for right now, you need to know caucuses, um, think of them as the same as primaries. Let's think about this real quick. Who is voting in primaries and caucuses? So if it's the Republican primary, who's actually going to spend the time to show up for the Republican primary? Right? If we remember our downs model, right? we have our curve, we have our two sides of the party. Let's actually use some color. Right? This is the Republican party over here. Who's actually going to show up to vote? It's going to be the people that are most extreme in the party. It's going to be this chunk. The people in the middle might not show up. There's a chance, okay? But it is the more loyal and more extreme members of the party that participate in primaries. I'll say that one more time. It is the more extreme, the more loyal members of a party that show up to vote in the primary. The next question we need to think about. How does this affect what the candidate says? Right? Who is the candidate what type of people is the candidate aiming his presentation, his campaign? Who is he trying to persuade? He's not trying to persuade that two-thirds of the country. He's trying to persuade the extremists in his party. This affects what the candidate says because he's trying to win the votes of the extremists in his party. He's going to say things that the tails of the party want to hear, not necessarily the most Americans in the middle want to hear. So, it's assumed that a candidate is successful. He convinces his party in a large number of the states in the United States, and he is going to win the party's nomination. Where, does he, where is he officially nominated? He is officially nominated at the party convention, as we saw in that YouTube video with the 70,000 screaming people and chanting Obama's name. So what happens? Again, remember that video, right? He's officially nominated at the party conventions, the nominee is officially announced. Um, the delegates from each state say we nominate Barack Obama, whatever, okay? Um, but important to think about, after this moment, after he's officially the nominee, who is the candidate appealing to after the convention? So again, think of our Downs model, all right? We have our two sides, okay? You do not need to be drawing this and more thinking, just so you can all see where I'm thinking, right? All right? So he was appealing to his base. We're talking about a Republican candidate, right? But now he needs to win everybody's vote. So he needs to go change from aiming towards this part of his 
the country to start aiming towards the middle, right? This is where the most votes are. So we may have said something in the primary. Candidates will say some things in the primaries to appeal to the base, but then have to change the exact wording of what they're saying. May not be quite as extreme in what they're saying because they need to convince the but they need to get 51% of the entire country. In order to get 51%, they're going to have to win lots of people in the middle, convince them to vote for them. The candidate after the convention is aiming at the middle of the country, so they have a chance at getting that magic 51% of the vote. If you just aim at the extreme of your party, the most you can get is 33%. And if you only get 33%, you're going to get your butt kicked. So... Zooming a little bit further in on the nomination process, there's obviously some politics. Who is the party going to choose? Who is the party going to support? Who are the big donors of the party willing to put their money behind? Right? How does who the party nominate matter? Okay? It matters a lot right? because they need to find someone that can both convince their base, right? convince the extreme parts of the party that they are a good member of the party so that that extreme doesn't break off, but at the same time they need somebody that can win the general election somebody that can convince the people in the middle, the undecideds, to vote for them. So they will often think about, does the candidate have a demographic advantage? Does the candidate have a demographic advantage? So are they going to be able to win some of the votes that they don't normally win? So, example, Sarah Palin in 2008. Sarah Palin in 2008. She is obviously a woman, okay? And she ran as the vice presidential candidate for... Um, the Republican Party. We will find out in a later lecture, but you can probably put it together easily now, right? Women generally vote Democrat, all right? There's a, there's a gender gap. Lots more women vote Democrat than Republican. So the Republicans thought, if we run a female, in this case for vice president, but they'd love to do it for president, right? We can maybe win a lot of those women that are in the center that we don't normally get. So they chose Sarah Palin, even though she was not a very, is not a very intelligent woman, relatively unheard of. But they're trying to get some women to vote for her, some more women than they normally get to vote for them, and the chance that they could win the election. However, you can't just choose some random person because you're trying to win a certain set of voters. Okay, um, you also have to make sure they have an ideological fit. You need to make sure that person has an ideological fit. So I'm going to give you a non-example of an ideological fit, so problems with ideological fit. When Mitt Romney, okay, so obviously last year's election, Mitt Romney was running in the primary, lots of people on the extremes of the Republican Party didn't like him. He was governor of Massachusetts, okay, a very liberal state. He had actually, when governor of Massachusetts, signed into law a state law that look at, looks remarkably similar to Obamacare that now exists over the entire country. They saw him as a very, very moderate, a very middle-of-the-road person. So they, lots of people were upset and did not vote for him. He actually struggled a little bit to win the nomination because he was not an ideological fit. He was not conservative enough for super conservative Republicans. Another important note about the nomination process. They can achieve, so if the party, excuse me, if the party is trying to win this, the election, right, and they have to compromise on maybe demographics or ideological fit for their presidential candidate, they can use the vice presidential choice to round out the ticket, all right? So Mitt Romney, or let's, let's uh, start with Joe Biden, actually. So what did he add? So Joe Biden was, in 2008, obviously Barack Obama's running mate. Barack Obama was young, relatively young, okay, black from the, the Midwest, okay? So Barack Obama brought in Midwest voters. Yay, Illinois, landslide win for the Democrats, right? All right, it definitely consolidated minorities around the Democrats because they were the first party ever willing to nominate a, um, a black for president of the United States. Um, however, there's pe members of the Democratic Party that are still a little unsure, right? Older voters are a little unsure about having a minority president. And they were also... Lots of people that were afraid, this guy has only been senator for four years. He's only held a national prominent office for four years, and he's running for president. I want my president to have lots of experience. Joe Biden, what he added, he added experience, okay? And he also added the grandpa feel, right? 
Lots of people liked Ronald Reagan because he kind of felt like grandpa's running the country. I'm confident, right? He has this like comfortable older uncle grandpa feel that people were who were not necessarily comfortable with the younger Barack Obama. Joe Biden was added to the ticket, rounded it out. Paul Ryan, who was running mate, the failing running mate of Mitt Romney last year, what did he add? He added strong conservatism. He was a strong conservative. Right? Recall that uh, extreme Republicans didn't really like Mitt Romney because they didn't think he was conservative enough, so they added on Paul Ryan to the ticket because he was a strong conservative. He was also young. Young guy, very in shape. Okay, Mitt Romney was seen as this old kind of um, stale guy, and then Paul Ryan, the young hip guy, trying to pull in some of the younger voters. So lots of thought goes into thinking about who is your nominee. Notice nowhere on here that I talk, did they think about who would be the best leading the country, right? They were simply thinking about winning the election because that's the goal of political parties. So some critiques of this system, of this nomination process. First, the best leaders don't always run. Just as I said, Colin Powell probably is one of the greatest leaders in the past 50 years to be born in the United States. Hands down, right? Very few people would argue, argue that point, that Colin Powell is one of the best leaders. He didn't run because he didn't want to have to go through the terrible process, the terrible ordeal that was a campaign. The best leaders don't always run. So then only a few states really matter. As we will see when we talk about the, the Electoral College, few states really matter. Candidates are actually only go going to go to a few number of states. So we're going to leave this for right now, but I need you to know only a few states matter. How is this? It's because of the structure of the Electoral College. So we'll add it in your notes. We will come back to this point um, at a later date. Next, money plays too big of a role. Plays too big of a role. Why? Well, it's a national campaign. The candidate, first point, the candidate cannot be everywhere, so they need television ads, they need signs, they need to hire people to campaign on that person's behalf. That costs a lot of money. Money plays too big of a role. The next critique, low participation in primaries. So who cares? Well, first, not lots of people always show up for primaries because they know it's not the real election that actually picks the person. So if you're not a very extreme or loyal member of your party, you're not going to show up to vote. Why is that significant? Okay, that means that the nominees, the significance here, the nominees do not represent the middle or the majority of the country. Significance, because there's low participation in primaries, again, our Downs model, right? They're going to choose the candidates that are here and here, not necessarily. The primaries rarely end up choosing a leader who's in the middle, okay, that everyone would actually agree. Again, they're choosing somebody that's on the edges that's not necessarily going to be the best leader for everyone. Finally, there's an argument that too much power is given to the media. Again, the candidates can't actually go around and meet everyone, so so much of the campaign happens through the media. There's too much going on, and we only end up hearing the media's interpretation. If the media runs a bad a story making one candidate look ter terrible, that's going to sway a lot of people's opinion, even though they've never actually met or read or heard anything right from the candidate's mouth. So, organization of a campaign. You have this big goal, you, want, you need to get hundreds of millions of people to vote for you in order to win President of the United States. How are you going to do that? I'd like you to take two minutes, so who's ever at the computer, you're going to pause the computer for two minutes. I want the class to please brainstorm all the different actions that must happen for a campaign to be successful. Think back to all the different events and people that were involved in last year's presidential election, if you can. Brainstorm all the different actions. Go ahead and pause. All right. So, hopefully you have a long list of different things that are going to happen. The candidate can't possibly do all those things, right? They have to hire somebody to do each of those things. They can't even run the campaign themselves. They have to hire a campaign manager. So the result of all these different jobs that need to take place is there's a large 
an expensive campaign organization. Again, I don't think that the picture appeared as it's supposed to. I'm just seeing a box right now. We'll talk about the example of George Bush's 2004 campaign. The point is that there are literally hundreds of people that are hired by the candidate to run their campaign. The candidate mainly is becomes a puppet of a campaign manager and their field offices that are trying to fly the, the candidate around the country to convince them to win. So there's campaign managers and there are political strategists. Please write that down. Those are the main things that are going on. They have hired campaign managers and political strategists that tell the candidate what to say so that they can win the election. All right. So I want you to see a comical and very narrowed down example of a campaign organization. So you are going to, in just a second, whoever is at the computer, um, the Daily Show link, you can either um, Google the Strategist Part 1 Daily Show or it should be in the email I sent to you. Before we look at that link, let's preview the questions. With such large campaigns, with hundreds of people manipulating what the candidate is saying, are the candidates fully in charge of their message or is the focus on being elected? So focus is on being elected. They're going to do certain things simply to win the election, not necessarily proving that they are the best leader and preparing in some way to have the largest responsibility in the country. So when we are watching this video, I want you to see when they interview these eighth graders. All right, it's an eighth grade class presidential election that we're going to watch. What are the actual goals of the candidates? Okay, what becomes the role of the strategists? And then what types of strategies and tactics are used? And what becomes the focus of the campaign? Is it the goals of the candidates? What ends up becoming the focus of the campaign? So please go ahead, click now, and watch these final two questions. Down here, these final two questions. These are your reflection question for today's lecture.